Hello and welcome to the recording of GUSD's first Parent Information Night of the 2021-22 school year. And this part of our recording is being redone because I did not record from the beginning of the actual presentation that happened on Thursday. So you'll notice in a few minutes it will transition to the original presentation that was recorded live um, on Thursday. So once again, this is the first parent information night of our school year this year, and it's a first in a series of four. So the topic tonight will be differentiation, and um, we're gonna just get into the basics of what that means and what that looks like in our district. So my name is Jill Means. I am a TOSA, or teacher on special assignment, and I, I work in instructional services and my focus is on gifted education and curriculum support. Also helping me with the presentation is Amy Wellborn, another TOSA for GUSD. She'll be helping with the chat and fielding questions from our audience. And I also have uh, Dr. Mary Kahn, who is the Assistant Superintendent of S Instructional Services. So tonight, um, as we go along, if there are questions, you'll notice we'll pause and uh, questions will be asked and answered as we go. And then hopefully we'll have a little time at the end as well. If you're watching this recording and you have questions that were not answered after you are finished watching, please do reach out to me. I'm happy to have a discussion with you or to respond to your questions in an email. All right, so let's start with a definition of differentiation. One definition is the efforts of teachers to respond to variance within a classroom. What is differentiation and what is it not? Let's look at the differences. So differentiation is understanding readiness, allowing for choice, facilitating high level thinking, quality planning, high expectations for all. And what is it not? It is not assigning more work to early finishers. It is not asking students to teach material they already know. And it is not giving every student an individual assignment. So when and how did differentiation become a key focus for GOSD? In 2013, what happened was we were transitioning from the California state standards to common core state standards. So in 2014, there would be no state test scores available. It had been seven years since any work in differentiation had been done in GUSD at that point. And there were changes in categorical funding for GATE. So all three of these um, situations or all three of these aspects of education at that time came together to lead our district in a direction in the direction of differentiation being a key part of um, what our teachers are trained to be able to do within the general education classroom i want to talk just for a minute too about what that meant in terms of changes in categorical oracle funding for gate so i'm going to read down here what it says the state no longer funds GATE specifically. However, during the creation of the LCAP or the Local Control Accountability Plan, the district deemed it essential to fund gifted support in an effort to promote excellence and equity for all students, including the needs of our gifted learners. This funding supports the differentiation that takes place within the regular school day and within the classroom. So that's what this presentation is going to be about. I'm going to be showing you what um, a few of our key pieces of differentiation look like within the classroom. So GUSD earmarks funds for gifted support through teacher trainings that I do, or the person in my role will, has done in the past, and support, math club, um, summer enrichment for identified fifth and sixth grade students. And this is where we will transition back to the actual live presentation or the recording of the live presentation. Differentiation and why are we 
uh, putting so much, investing so much of our time and resources into classroom teachers when it comes to meeting the needs of high level and all students. Well, research says that a teacher is said to have two to three times the impact of any other school factor. That includes services, facilities, leadership, and leadership. Effective teaching has the potential to help level the playing field for individual and family characteristics largely outside a school's control. So I really like this cartoon. Uh, I think it resonates with me and, and a lot of others who I've shared it with. It's, it's sort of a popular image in, in our field. Why would we want to um, put all of our resources into say a gate teacher that sees gifted identified or high achieving students um, for 45 minutes a week when we could sink those resources into all of our teachers who are with your children all day, every day. So th this is part of the research that led to our decision to and our, our movement toward um, our approach to gifted education in the district. So I have two committees that help support me in our goals for GOSD. And one of them is a parent advisory committee and the other is a teacher advisory committee. And our mission statement is to support social and emotional development and provide challenging learning opportunities responsive to the needs of high ability students using research-based differentiated instructional practices applied but not limited to grade level standards. So we'll pause for a moment and I'd like to go ahead and open up the floor and take some take time for two or three questions. So this is where if you could either, if you have your video on, you can just raise your hand. If you have, if you wanna raise your digital hand, if your screen is off, that works as well. And Amy's gonna scroll through the audience. We, it looks like we have 76 participants, so it may take her a while to scroll through. If we don't have any questions, then we'll go ahead and move on. But Amy, if you could help me with that. I'm not seeing anybody yet, Jill. Okay. All right, well, let's keep going. There'll be a couple more opportunities throughout the presentation. So what is depth and complexity? Actually, I think we, what is depth and complexity? I think we skipped, well, it is not letting me go back. Okay, well, let's go with, there are, I remember the slide, there are three, um, key components of, of differentiation that we focus on when we're discussing differentiation with our teachers and we're doing our teacher trainings. And those are depth and complexity, universal themes, and independent studies. We're going to start with depth and complexity. What is it? It originated from the 1994 California Department of Education framework. It was first described as a thinking curriculum because it increased the level of academic challenge for gifted and high ability students. It is a set of 11 prompts that elicit open-ended thinking and reasoning. The 11 prompts of depth and complexity are here. There are eight elements of depth and three elements of complexity. So under the elements of depth, we have language of the discipline, details, patterns, trends, rules, ethics, unanswered questions, and big idea. And under elements of complexity, we have multiple perspectives, change over time, and across discipline. So these prompts and these icons that you see are like another language in our classrooms. The students, as they go, develop through the grade levels, become very, very familiar with these, these icons and, and what they are and what they represent. And they're able to eventually, at, at, in sixth grade, use them fluidly throughout their learning in the classroom. 
So it doesn't start right away. We have a rollout, there's a grade level progression. So we start in kindergarten with what, what we consider the three most basic, and that's big idea, details, and patterns. And so the kindergarten teachers, kindergarten teams uh, work with each other to ensure that their students are experts in these three prompts before they continue, their students continue on to first grade. And then you can see that we add one to two and in from second to third, uh, three prompts until finally in fourth grade, they have been introduced to all of the prompts and they continue to develop their, their understanding of them throughout fourth, fifth and sixth grades. So as parents, this is a great opportunity. These are great um, prompts and icons to know about and to get used to, because you can bring these into your discussions at home, at the dinner table, in the car, on vacations, um, and, it, and it helps create that home school connection. Because depth and complexity doesn't just exist in the classroom, it exists everywhere. I also think it's important to note, and I think it's very interesting that teachers report that um, that the three areas that seem most challenging for students to connect with are rules across disciplines and trends. So those seem, it would make sense because those are the last to be introduced, but it also is reported um, from sixth grade teachers that it still seems to be challenging more, more so than others for students to connect with those prompts. So here's a couple of pictures of some depth and complexity frames. What I'd like to do um, with these following slides is I'm just going to show you some pictures of that I've captured as I've uh, visited classrooms to give you a sense for what it looks like in a classroom. What are they doing with depth and complexity? So these are two frames that are up on um, teachers whiteboards and these two teachers are actually third grade teammates. They're obviously working on the same uh, unit in our Wonders Language Arts curriculum. And they've, they've picked slightly different um, icons to focus on and prompts for their, their students to think about. It could be because the teacher gave the students the choice. It could be because the teachers found slightly different um, lenses that they thought would be interesting to look at. But you can see how the frames are, frames are very versatile. And these, this is a very popular tool, a very commonly used tool in our district. And we also have blank frames on paper that teachers will give out um, as it, when students need a little more um, depth or complexity in their lessons um, with our Wonders um, curriculum or any curriculum that they're using. So all of our teachers have um, depth and complexity magnets, and it's interesting to see different teachers using them in different ways. There's even a couple of teachers who have uh, created magnet-like images on paper and have placed them around the room. So this teacher you can see is using them um, in her schedule. So she's, she's pointing out to her students, we're going to be learning about big ideas and details during our writing, grammar, and our ELD time. We'll be discussing patterns, unanswered questions, and rules during math, and then reading science, social studies, we'll notice, we'll make connections with change over time and language of the discipline. And then over here, um, we use Amplify for our science curriculum. The students have developed questions based on their new science unit that they're learning. And the teachers simply acknowledge that that's a part of learning, that we have unanswered questions. And here we are as scientists, and we're gonna explore these unanswered questions. And then this is a fun one. This sixth grade teacher is, was um, beginning a unit on um, writing um, and argumentative, argumentative essay writing. Uh, should sixth graders have cell phones? Uh, and, and they were discussing, they were having a debate first, and then they were going to turn it into a, an opinion or an argumentative essay. So they were talking about the big idea and then, of course, the multiple perspectives that go along with that. This is an assignment here um, that a teacher gave her whole class as she was, they were reading aloud a, a story um, and students, instead of passively listening to the story, were asked to create this depth and complexity um, matrix, if you will. So in the six squares on the front and then five more on the back, they have each of the 11 prompts. This is a sixth grade class. And as the teacher is reading, the students have this out and they are, they're processing what they're hearing and they're, they're, they're collecting 
their thoughts and their connections to the story through these various lenses throughout the time. And this was toward the end of the book. So you can see this particular student had been doing quite a bit of active listening and processing. And then over here, we have at the beginning of the year, a lot of teachers like to use this. It's a um, kind of a getting to know you, the depth and complexity of students. So it has a, it has, it's a flip booklet. It has a page for what are the patterns in your life? What are your unanswered questions about your life? What are your key details? Are there rules in your life that are important to you? So the students um, each get to create a booklet and those are displayed in their classroom. So here we get come to um, a con the concept of connection collections. And I really like this, the way this teacher um, came up with that idea. What a lot of teachers do is they create bulletin boards with sticky notes so that kids can put their, when they make a connection, they can write it on a sticky note and they can put it up on whichever prompt they connected with um, at that time. And here's a, a close up of one of those. It says um, over time, it's a, so it's a change over time connection. At first they got $5 a person, now they don't get much. <laughs> So that was a connection um, to change over time in the in lit, in a book they're reading in class called Front Desk. Uh, so I have uh, a video here that I want to play for you. It's um, of a teacher. Her name is Sam Farver, Samantha Farver. She's a fourth grade teacher at Elwood. Uh, my son happens to be in her class, and she was talking about how she was going to introduce her connection collections, both for depth and complexity and her universal theme, which we're going to go over in a minute. So I asked if I could record her on the spot. So she, <laughs> she's, she asked for a, she, she wasn't dressed necessarily for the occasion. They had, she had teach PE that day, but I, I promised her I would give that disclaimer. So I'm going to go ahead and um, connect to that video. Hey, I noticed a pattern or I noticed a change over time. We can celebrate it on our wall. So I like to call these the connection collections. Okay. Because over time, we can celebrate so here is where we're going to collect all of the depth and complexity elements. So you notice like, hey, in front desk yesterday, like Ashley noticed a word and she had put it up on our vocabulary and it was, we talked about uh, Mr. Yao's Taiwanese accent. And we talked about how that may not be a good vocabulary word because it's super specific and it was the meaning and trying to do it for our purposes, it didn't really fit. But we talked about that it might be good for our language of the discipline. Nod your head. Yes, I remember having that conversation. So if we had our connection collection up and running, I would have told Ashley, go ahead and add it to our collection. And so what you can do for that is I have my stash of post-it notes over here, and I'll have a spot probably right over here where I keep them. So I have all my post-it notes. And so then Ashley can take one and write front desk, because that's what we're talking about, right? Our novel. She's talking about math, she'd write math. If we were talking about a different text, you could write the text. If we we're talking about science, social studies, whatever it is, you're going to label the subject. And then she would talk, write what we learned about Mr. Yao's Taiwanese accent. I'm not sure, but are you talking about like a detail from the story that's important, but maybe not as big as the big idea? Yeah. Okay. Jacob, one last thing. It has to be a specific thing. It can be like anything that you like here outside of school. Can you like when you come back from, like let's say when you read for a minute, you see, you see a trend, can you put it there? If you can explain where you found it and how it's connected to your learning in some way, I'm fine with that. So I like that because the, the, um, the student asked about at home or things that are happening outside of the classroom, can they, can he make a connection in that way? So this is just a great um, opportunity for you to think about, okay, the depth and complexity doesn't just happen in the classroom, it, cl it happens at home and it's proof that kids are thinking about it all the time. So you can help encourage that at home. So if we pause again and take time, uh, maybe just for one or two questions as we move through, if there's any questions about depth and complexity before we move on to universal themes.
I just had one question. We had a bad link, so uh, we're just joining now. Is this going to be recorded for later or transcribed or is there yes. like a summary that we could get for what we missed? Yes. So I, I did begin the recording. So we are recording now and I will be posting it on our website. And when um, I, at the end of tomorrow or when we we're all wrapped up and it's posted, I will go ahead and post an update on that original post that says it is now linked to the website. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Jill, there's a question in the chat that asks, are all teachers using this? My daughter said this doesn't look familiar. Okay, so all teachers have been trained or are being trained. So we have a lot of new teachers. In fact, I have 50, five, zero, um, new to GOSD, not necessarily new teachers, but new to GOSD teachers that are in the training currently. And we have gone over depth and complexity and they have been doing assignments. So um, I encourage you to dig a little deeper with your teacher. If your child is saying it doesn't look familiar, maybe find out, ask specifically about depth and complexity and how it's being used in the classroom. We have another question, Jill. It says, can you please explain about trends in depth and complexity? <laughs> no, <laughs> just kidding. Yes, I can explain it. And, and I think that um, a good, the best way to do it would be to give an example. So students may be um, reading about climate change and there may be a trend in what's in what's happening with weather with weather events in various areas in the region and that would be a chance for teachers to point out okay this is a trend and so when we talk about trends this is a perfect example of one perhaps they're reading about fashion design which is an obvious one there are trends in the 80s fluorescent colors were cool you know and and this kind of thing so so it's connecting the students whenever there's a trend in whatever it is that they're discussing, connecting them to that concept of trends. Hopefully that answers the question. All right, why don't we go ahead and move on so we stay on track and then we'll pause again. So universal themes is our next area of focus. A universal theme is an idea that applies to anyone regardless of cultural differences or geographic location. Universal themes are ways to connect ideas across all disciplines. A theme is a central idea about the human condition. It is a generalization about life or human nature. So over here on the left side, we have our grade levels listed with our uh, uh, universal themes. So we have one theme per grade level, and then sort of these big idea questions that when teachers are introducing the universal theme and then discussing it throughout the year, they often refocus students' energy and attention on these big ideas. So for example, in kindergarten, Order is a big deal. If you have, a, have or have ever had a, a kindergartner, I'm sure you can understand why order was a great choice for kindergarten. They like to have a routine. They like things to be in order. Uh, maybe not their bedrooms, but um, in the classroom setting, order is a big part of their day. So the big ideas are we put things in order. Order helps us to organize. Order is the opposite of chaos. And this goes all the way up through um, sixth grade. So for first grade, we have patterns. Second grade is cause and effect. Third grade, relationships. Fourth grade, systems. Fifth grade, change. And sixth grade is power. And so this idea of power is a, is a bit more abstract, which is why we save it for sixth grade and, and not try to introduce that abstract understanding to kindergartners. But you can see over here the big ideas. Power can be man-made or natural. Power is the ability to influence. Power can be used or abused. And power is always present in some form. So I have on this slide two videos. And we're going we're gonna to start with this video by Ian Bird. 
who is um, an expert in the field of differentiation. And I really enjoy his resources because I think he, he, he does gear his resources mostly toward teachers, but um, he speaks in a way that's understandable. He doesn't use a lot of educational jargon. He just speaks in common terms and it's very easy to understand what he's trying to get across. So this is um, an example of how a teacher might introduce a universal theme to their class and this particular theme is systems. So I have to, because it's a, a subscribed um, a subscribed issue, I have to go ahead and type in my password and we will, oh, it didn't come up. There it is. So we're just gonna watch the first video and then the fifth video. Let's introduce the universal theme of systems. We call this a universal theme because it can apply to anything. It's not an idea that only works with math or only with writing or only with baseball. We can see systems everywhere. Now, a system is something that has different parts that work together. It makes me think of the human body or a basketball team or an engine. Each of these are systems with different pieces that work together. So the first thing you're going to do is to keep brainstorming examples of systems. And don't stop with just 10 or 15, keep going and going. This works best when you do it with a whole bunch of people so you can hear ideas that you might not have thought of. Once you have a few dozen examples of systems, come on back for the next video. Let's introduce the universal theme of Oops, systems. Sorry. We call this a universal. There we go. So we're going to go to part five now. And this is how he wraps it up. Whenever we come up with a big idea statement, I like to see what new ideas we can connect to. So we're going to rebuild that graphic organizer like this. We're going to put your statement up top this time. And now we're going to try to build support for it underneath with examples from different areas. Now, again, you could make three or four or five columns, and each column is going to represent a different area. And that could mean different school subjects like math, language arts, science. It could be different areas of your life like school, family, and sports, or even specific books or specific units within one subject. Whatever you and your teacher decide on, we're going to look for examples that support the big idea. I'm going to use three school subjects, math, language arts, and science. And in math, a multiplication expression like this is a human-made system that can form a larger system of numbers and symbols. In language arts, a sentence is a human-made system that can be part of a larger system, like a paragraph. And in science, a pig is a natural system, but it's also part of a larger system, like a food web, and then maybe an ecosystem. And I could keep going in each of these areas. Now, I always like it when students come up with interesting ideas, not just 100% perfect ideas. So feel free to stretch your thinking here and take a risk. So you're going to think of three or four or five areas then come up with examples in each of those areas that support the big idea you created in the last video. Okay. So back to our slides. I also have a video of Mrs. Farver again. Um, and so this is the same day. So right after she introduced her um, collection, connection collection for depth and complexity, she introduced the collection for systems, the fourth grade universal theme. So uh, we won't have time to watch the whole video, but I'm gonna go ahead and show you how it look, what it looks like in a GOSD right, classroom. Like years ago, doesn't it? What do we remember about systems? When we were doing our searches for the different kinds of systems, what do we remember from that? I know it's like probably a little bit of a reach back into your brain. What do we remember? I'd love to hear from something I haven't heard from. What do we know about systems? Like we talked about, if we go to lunch, if we have no, we, we didn't have a system for getting our lunch, what would happen? 
look, if we didn't have a system for going to lunch, and I said, it's lunchtime, though, would that work out so well for anybody? No, why not? People might run. Yeah, that doesn't seem safe. Yeah, you might run into people. Also, would there be any, who would know, like, who's supposed to get their lunch first? You all just start taking off and running for the MPR. Does that seem like a good system for getting our lunch? No, that seems like chaos, doesn't it? We talked about having systems like that at school where that keep things running smoothly. What were some other examples of systems we've heard about? Or heard, yeah, at either at school or at home or even broader out in our community or in the world. Zoe, what else? Um, there's the solar system. Definitely not just something that affects us at school, but it's out in the our solar system, part of our universe, even. Valeria, what else? Ecosystem. Ecosystem. Excellent. Jacob. We also have a digestive system. Yes, we talked about that. Jeremiah, what were you going to say? A what? A light system. Light system. Yeah, we talked about electrical system, the light, the light. Yeah. Okay, so do you think it's possible now that we know about all the systems out in the world or in our community or in our school or in our home? Do you think that we can now find systems when we're learning about other things, like when we're reading front desk? Yeah. What about when we're talking, learning about different math concepts? Yeah. yeah. What about science? Yeah. And social studies. Yeah. 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 So I already started one. I started our collection because I noticed the other day, or actually, I guess it was like more than a week ago now, when Ms. Rodriguez was doing a lesson with you all, we talked about meters and centimeters and decimeters. And we talked about how we have a customary system in the United States where we use inches and feet and yards. So Mrs. Farver goes on to talk about um, how the students need to, uh, when they think about these systems, they can they can celebrate their connection with the with their universal theme by jotting it down on a sticky and then they put it up on their bulletin board. And that is um, a great segue into bulletin boards. So I just am going to show you a few pictures of some bulletin boards that I have taken pictures of as I've been touring through classrooms in Goleta. This is a sixth grade bulletin board for power. And you can see a close up. Um, one student said TV had power by spreading the word. Um, this says Nick shared his money with his family and school. This one, his new word had power. Here's another bulletin board in a third grade classroom for relationships. And you can see those key ideas, the key questions are posted up here. It looks like they also did a collage of relationships and then their connections that they've made have been posted. Here's a few more for change. We have cause and effect here for second grade. This teacher chose to focus, have the kids focus on cause and effect in, with, with it, within themselves, within school and the world. And here's one where the big ideas are posted and then the teacher asks them to focus on that big idea and see how they can connect with systems in that way. So let's take, we actually don't have a lot of time. So let's just see if there's one question maybe we can get to either that's already in the chat, Amy, or if there's someone with a hand up. Nothing's in the chat yet, and I don't see any hands. All right, we're gonna keep moving then. So our third um, aspect or third focus for differentiation in Goleta, and it's not, these are not our only three, but these are the three primary focuses for differentiation um, today we're gonna, that we're focusing on today. So depth and complexity, universal themes, and now independent study. What is independent study? So I'm just gonna go ahead and read to you what this slide says. Independent study, is designed to accommodate varied interests and abilities of individual students in the classroom. The steps of independent study follow the process of academic research and include identifying an area of interest, writing a research question, gathering resources, researching, summarizing, 
and sharing findings. Students with unique and or high ability tend to identify strong areas of interest at a very young age. Highly curious, they often display a need for understanding topics that while maybe, maybe academic may not be covered in school. Independent study offers students the op opportunity to research interests of their own and further practice reading, informative writing, and oral presentation skills. So on this next slide, we're gonna talk about what that looks like for classrooms. So in a K-1 or two level classroom, independent study, the word independent is a little bit of a misnomer because of course we're not going to stick a kindergartner in the corner and ask them to do a research project on their own. It's actually um, very much a partnership between the teacher and the student. And oftentimes at, in the younger grades, the parents are very heavily involved in the, pro in the process as well. So um, if you are a K-2, a parent of a K-2 child, um, and you think that independent study is something that your child might benefit from or might be interested in, it's worth a conversation with your teacher. Um, but there may be some, there may be a, um, a need for you to be involved at some, somewhat at home in some of the checking and some of the help with the research. Um, in our upper grades, in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, um, we well, not this year for the fourth, but fifth and sixth grade for this year, um, it is a requirement that gifted identified students participate in an independent study through in the independent study process at least once during their school year. Um, and it's not for everyone. So it works well for many students, but it isn't, it isn't the right tool for differentiation for all high, high achievers or all gifted identified students. But the teacher, teachers in fifth and sixth grade with gifted identified students this year are expected to introduce the process to their gifted identified students. Um, in many cases, Teachers will do this with their whole class first, and then they'll make it optional for the rest of the year, at which point specific students um, who are passionate about, um, about certain topics may take up the opportunity. And as I mentioned, it is assigned to gifted students, gifted identified students in the upper grades. It is optional for all, and it's used as a way to compact curricul curriculum when a student already has depth of knowledge on a topic you're about to teach. So let's say a teacher is about to um, do a unit on um, a comprehension unit on a book, Charlotte's Web, and this uh, a student has already read Charlotte's Web, and uh, the the teacher gives the uh, the assessment, the end of unit assessment to the child, and the child aces the assessment. There really is no sense in asking that the child to participate in the, that project at that time. So that it would be an alternative to, to having them sit through what's something that they've already mastered is to develop, work with the student to develop an independent study question. Um, and so the who, what, when, where, and why, and how of that, um, it's important to understand that the teacher is involved in the process, but the students, and it's a partnership and that the parents can be involved as well. The most difficult piece of it is often developing the right research question. So I'm, I have a little video, um, let's see, 647. We're gonna try it. I'll show part of it. This is a third grade class that I what had a few a, years a ago, and it's me taking them what through the process of a, developing a, of a research a question. What about it? What attributes? Okay, let's go with Aylin. Um, well, you first have to check if it can't just be a question that you can't just ask yes or no, or if it's a list. Okay, so I think what I'm hearing you say, for example, this one, who studies biomimicry? Could we just answer that with one sentence? Yeah. So would that be a very interesting research project? No. No. So then we came, we decided that these two questions would be closer to a three. We gave them a two plus. So what kinds of things have been invented using biomimicry? 
Dig deeper, look at your words, your key words there, your key vocabulary, key ideas, and see if you can take these questions and incorporate them with those key ideas. Do we want to evaluate? Do we want to identify? Do we want to analyze these questions? And pick a key word or two and see if you can include them in your, in your question. Meanwhile, let's keep in mind these concepts. Joseph, please read what we're supposed to think about while we're making our question. We're supposed to think about why, where, how, when, who, and what. Okay. Ooh, that's an interesting concept. What's what influences? Say your say your question. He said, "What influences people to study biomimicry?" Can you under can you explain? Can you elaborate a little bit? What do you, what do you mean by that? I mean like what makes them want to study biomimicry? What what made them get the idea? Of, oh, wait, why can't we just study animals and see all this? Get all this new stuff. Oh, so like who who is the point of biomimicry? No, like who inspired people to start doing biomimicry? Maybe who or what? Yeah. Uh, okay. Does that make more sense? Yeah. I guess okay. So. Okay. So go ahead and revise. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or what about the word how? How have different types of, can you try thinking, starting with how have different types of biomimicry? How have types of biomimicry began? Evolved, wow, began. How did different types of biomimicry begin? Began in evolve or if begin and evolve or like maybe like what like influenced someone to make like the multiple butterfly body yeah or like just Ooh, like, that's very specific can you say that again luke uh it's in our elb book okay can you say it one more uh, time the morpho butterfly phone what influenced people to is that what you were thinking yeah. of? think of something like, specific yeah well since we don't have a lot of background on biomimicry you could be more general by saying what influenced people to research and create different inventions something yeah. with the word inventions and then different types of biomimicry okay Okay, let's play. Okay, so we're going to stop there. And um, I wanted to show that because the, it's oftentimes most difficult to support students in taking their idea and helping them hone it in on a researchable question. So a lot of kids are passionate about something, but they don't know how to how to create a question that that can be researched. And, and, a, and a project could be created about it. Um, but when they do come up with a great question and they are supported in the process, they often come up with wonderful, um, wonderful products. That could be a slideshow, it could be a poster board, it could be a how-to presentation. And in the past, we didn't have one last year, but in the past we've showcased those independent studies that, that students have created at an independent study showcase in our boardroom. Not sure if we're going to be able to do that this year uh, because of our pandemic situation, but if we can, we certainly will, and it will happen sometime in the end of May. So stay tuned for more information on that. It will not affect whether or not students are given an opportunity to go through the process um, in, their, in their classrooms. Um, but but if, um, if we're able to have the showcase, it's a great way to let other people celebrate the work that students are doing in their classroom. So I want to, um, we're, we're running out of time quickly, and I want to point out this slide before we get to um, our last opportunity for questions. Resources for parents. There's a lot out there. So I tried to um, focus in on a few that I think are great resources. 
Um, of course, Ian Bird. So we saw a little glimpse of his work. It's birdseed.com. And again, you can either take a, um, a screenshot of this or take a picture of it with your phone. Um, but it also, this slideshow will be posted on our website and I'll let you know um, with an update on our parent square post when that happens. Um, Ian Bird has a lot of good free re resources. You can also subscribe to a free weekly, I think it's weekly or monthly newsletter. Um, the California Association, Association for the Gifted has great resources. They even have a parent tab um, and they have a conference for parents as well. So that might be something you're interested in looking into. And then this is um, Reading Rockets is just a, it's a great website that has very basic, but readable and understandable information about differentiation. And they also have a lot of links to other resources that uh, discuss differentiation. And then resources in writing. I, I highlighted this one, the number talks curriculum. This is a link to a PDF because I, I get a lot of, I hear a lot of parents um, struggling with how do I help my child in math these days? Because the way that teachers teach math, the way that students are learning math these days is nothing like the way I learned it. We can't borrow and carry. Standard algorithm isn't the, it is a, it is a strategy, but it isn't the first one that we teach and it's not the only one we rely on. So parents are sort of at a loss for how to teach basic math or support their, their students with math. Uh, the number talks curriculum I like because it gives a really, um, it's for teachers, but it explains how we teach arithmetic these days, adding and adding and subtracting, multiplying and dividing. And then Living with Intensity is a great book that I've actually not read myself. It's on my list, but I've it's been referred to me several times. Um, and I put it on here because I think our so, the social, social emotional health of our children these days is a, is a hot topic and we're all very concerned. It's not just for um, not just for gifted or high level learners, but for all students, um, I think are, can sometimes experience this. Um, this anxiety that comes with living with the situation that we're all living through right now with the pandemic. So I, I recommend that if you're interested in picking up a new book to read. And then of course, your in-person resources. So your first resource when wanting to get specific information and support for your child is your child's teacher. Um, and then if for some reason you just don't feel like your questions are being answered um, after discussing your needs and your child's needs with, with your teacher, um, you can always bring in the principal for, for more support. We also have your GES, Gifted Education Support Parent Rep, and your teacher rep from our, the two advisory committees that um, help support me in my role. And on the next slide, I will show you those names and again, uh, their information will be available in the slideshow um, on our website, but also we're in the process of getting our web, our website, our GUSD website up to speed so that there is a link to your parent rep on your school's site with um, that will forward an email to their personal email. So still working on getting that set up, but it should be done within the next couple of weeks. So when by the time we get back from winter break, it should be good to go. And then of course I am available. So if you have questions and you're not sure where to turn, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I have my email there and my phone number and my, my extension. And here is that list that I mentioned. I know it may be a little bit hard to see. Um, we do not, unfortunately, have a this. Oh, we actually lost our rep from Hollister and Brandon. So if you are interested in becoming a Brandon or Hollister parent rep, please let me know. And that brings us to time for final questions. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop my share so I can see the audience a little bit better. We have just a few minutes, but I'd love to answer any questions. Amy. So they've been coming in on the chat. Okay. Um, one person asked, um, does, how does GUSD support the social emotional needs of gifted students? 
It's a great question. So we have a program called Second Step and all teachers are using Second Step in their classroom and it is designed to support social emotional needs of students. Another question is how are gifted students identified? I'm going to pause on that one in just a minute because I remembered we also have an, a, a program called Inner Explorer that our student that our teachers have access to, and actually you as parents have access to it as well. It's a mindfulness program, so that's Inner Explorer. I encourage you to reach out to your teacher if you have concerns about your child's social emotional well being, um, or if you want to find out how you can connect to Inner Explorer. They have information about that. Okay, sorry, Amy, can you repeat that last question again? About social emotional needs or the one? I uh, know the one, the one right after. Um, how are gifted students identified? Great question. Okay, so that's all happening as we speak. Um, we are in, we, are, we just yesterday held the training for all third and fourth grade teachers to administer the COGAT, which is our universal screener for gifted identification. And the testing window for the COGAT is January 7th to January 31st. All third and fourth graders will be tested unless a parent signs an opt-out form that will be coming via Parent Square next week. Um, and all, all fifth and sixth graders new to GUSD should have already been sent a permission slip to test. So if there are no, um, no COGAT scores or other uh, similar tests in their CUME files, then we would, um, we would like to get that information. So are we saying that there's no testing for, for kindergarten through third? Um, the, for COGAT, the testing is for third and fourth graders. This year for fourth, because we couldn't screen them last year in third, but typically it, it's for third graders. But, and, and there's no, if you're asking about, I'm not sure if you're asking about COGA or other. Well, I'm just asking for gifted identifiers. So for, for example, kindergarten first and second, how are they identified? They, they are not, they are not officially identified until third grade. But teachers are part of my training talks about how uh, how to identify gifted learner, young gifted learners without a test, how, how okay. to meet the needs of we call them our, you know, our high achievers, our high, high potential, high ability learners. Um, what, whether we, we, we know that children don't suddenly become gifted after a test right in third grade. So teachers are trained to, to watch for that, to look for that, those tendencies and to meet the, the child's needs. Okay, so if, if, I, if, if a teacher has come to me and started this process and talking, I'm just assuming that I'm just gonna work with a teacher this year. I have a kindergartner. Correct. Okay. Correct. Thank you, thank you. No problem. One last question, Jill. We have a few others, but I don't think we're gonna have time. Um, one person asked, can you share the recorded video if we join late? How will that be shared? Yes. So we will post it on the website with the slideshow. So when, and once that happens, the video of the Zoom recording, once that happens, I will post an update on the original Parent Square notification about this meeting so that you know that it's there and ready for access. So if you, I'm so, so sorry, we're out of time. If you had a question and you didn't get it answered, if you could email me or you can call me um, and I can um, put that slide back up. I would love to be able to answer your questions. So let's see. There it is down there in the corner. Jill, there's one more question about, is it possible to ask for a reassessment in higher grades? Yeah, so that, that's another great question. If there, we do offer a, in a, a, a recommendation form, an appeal. So if you feel, if your child tested in third grade and you feel that, and, and didn't qualify and you would like your child to have another opportunity, 
you can talk with your teacher or you can talk with me, but we, we have forms that the teacher and the parent would fill out. And then it goes to the committee for a review to see if the, the child qualifies to retest. And then we would notify you. And that process happens in November and December. And then those, those, the people who have been accepted, the, whose appeals have been accepted, those parents have um, received notification and a, and a letter for permission form as well. Does it, hopefully that answers the question. Okay, I'm gonna stop the share again so I can see your faces or your screens. Um, and I thank you for coming tonight. I appreciate your time. Um, I know that it's precious these days. Uh, and then if you, I do encourage you, I have an open, well, you can't have an open door policy <laughs> these days, but I have an open phone line and an open Zoom and an open email policy. I, I love to, to talk with parents about their questions and concerns, ideas, thoughts. So please don't hesitate to reach out to me, reach out to your teacher, those other um, human resources that I offered and um, have a lovely evening. And we'll be having another parent information night in January. So stay tuned for more information about that on Parent Square. Have a good night.